Bonsoir et euh, bienvenue. C'est un honneur pour nous de recevoir euh, Monsieur le Président de l'UMP, Jean-François Copé, ce soir. Just kidding, don't worry, not doing it in French. <laughs> Tempted though it might be for us and also for uh, Jean-François. Good evening, I'm Ken Weinstein. I am uh, President and CEO of Hudson Institute. And I uh, would like to wish a warm welcome to the audience here in person at the Betsy and Walter Stern Conference Center at Hudson Institute, and also to our live audience on C-SPAN around America. And I also want to give a special thanks to the terrific folks at C-SPAN for the important service that you provide to all of us. Tonight, we have a truly exceptional program, a speech by French opposition leader Jean-Francois Copé on France's role within Europe and Europe's role on the global stage. Now, before I have the honor of introducing uh, Jean-Francois, whom I have had the pleasure of knowing for many years, let me say a few words about Hudson Institute and also about our topic for this evening. Hudson is, as all of you know, a market-oriented international policy research organization dedicated to original research and analysis that promotes security, prosperity, and freedom. We were founded in 1961 by the late geostrategist Herman Kahn, a brilliant, creative, and unconventional thinker. And ever since Kahn's time, and for more than half a century now, Hudson scholars have paid special attention to France, publishing regularly in key publications and being interviewed by key French media outlets, a number of whom are with us this evening. Hudson, in fact, was almost unique, I think, among American policy research organizations who, after a clear-eyed analysis, supported General de Gaulle's decision to remove France's nuclear arsenal from under the NATO umbrella. So we have a long Gaullist uh, tradition here at Hudson. Noting, in effect, at the time, in a very controversial uh, report that we did, that an independent force de frappe, an independent French uh, nuclear deterrent would be more credible than a U.S. controlled deterrent against the Soviet threat. Few here, I dare say, will remember that Hudson for many years had a Paris office, one that I have to say I am ready to reopen, <laughs> but only under one condition, that I be named director. <laughs> no, but, but in, all, in all seriousness, our scholars have had a, a long tradition of briefing key French officials, including French presidents, starting with Georges Pompidou. Hudson, in fact, was the first think tank in Washington to host a rising star in French politics, the then finance minister, a man named Nicolas Sarkozy, in October 2004 at a luncheon that was widely celebrated in the French press that drew about as much French press uh, as we have here this evening. And we enjoyed uh, briefing uh, the president and his key advisors on numerous occasions. While Hudson, I should note, continues to recognize the critical importance of France, and our European allies, that sentiment unfortunately is un not universally held here in Washington. To be frank, U.S.-European relations are in a challenging period, and not simply the result of either the pivot to Asia or the Snowden revelations. A rising tide of isolationism in both political parties and a White House that prides itself on multilateralism, but whose behavior on key issues from missile defense to Afghanistan, Syria, and Iran is unfortunately often more unilateral than its predecessor and is frequently criticized as such in the European press, has left Europeans with the sense that the alliance means far less today than at any time since World War II. Adding to these challenges from a French perspective, as, as we'll hear shortly, is the fact that France obviously is mired in a deep recession with unemployment at a, almost 11%, a crisis so deep that it has shattered the Franco-German unity that was the engine driving the European project, and has also helped fuel the rise of extreme right political parties who, were the European elections, parliamentary elections to be held today, would fare astonishingly well in many countries, including France. So against this challenging backdrop, we are truly fortunate to have as our speaker this evening the Right Honorable Jean-Francois Copé, the president of France's UMP, the Gaullist Union for a Popular Movement. Jean-Francois Copé's impressive bio, I think, is known to all of us in this room. A graduate of my alma mater, Sciences Po, and of the École Nationale d'Administration, Copé has been entrusted with many key leadership positions, including majority leader of the French Parliament, budget minister, and government spokesman. 
In addition to serving as a member of the French National Assembly and as mayor of the town of Meaux, he is the founder and driving force behind Génération France, an important think tank that has spurred critical reflection on important issues in France. In May 2012, in an election that stunned much of the French political establishment, of course, Jean-François Copé was elected president of the UMP, defeating former Prime Minister François Fillon. Jean-François won that election by doing precisely what he has done throughout his career in public life, frankly addressing key issues of concern to voters, such as immigration, that often leave other officials squeamish, grasping for words, and incapable of straight talk. Because of his insight, because of his experience, tenacity, and powerful debating skills, I think all of which we will see this evening, Copé is among the leading figures in French politics and will be for some time to come. Let me also say that we're also honored to have Madame Copé with us uh, this evening as well. So let me conclude without any further ado, and let's give a warm welcome to uh, Jean-Francois Copé, who will speak and then take questions uh, from the audience. Mr. President, thank you very much, dear Ken, and it's a real pleasure and a great honor for me to, uh, to be with, with you uh, tonight, and let me tell you something, I really apologize for being uh, late, because, uh, um, first of all, uh, in order to be on time, I decided from Paris to come and to fly with a plane from United Airlines, and, and, and something terrible happened. And I would like to tell it to you. Uh, the plane get breakdown, and then the, the crew member said, "Sorry, we will be very late." So I said, "No problem. I will take Air France." <laughs> <laughs> and and the plane of United Airlines has, has been totally cancelled, and the one of Air France arrived on time. Sorry, it's just a symbol to say that. <laughs> Sometimes I've heard that. In America, there is sort of French bashing. I would like to report my, my own experience about the fact that sometimes the French airplanes are, are arriving on time. And it's a way for me to say again to Ken Benstein how I'm happy and, and very proud to be your guest tonight. Because it's a great opportunity for me to tell you a little bit about what's going on in Europe and in France during this very particular time that we are living all together. First of all, I'd like to tell you about personal reflections about the European crisis, what we have to face now, and then I will be very happy to answer to your questions if you have some. First of all, a word about the crisis that we have to face. Um, this is not a punctual economic crisis, it's a long-term crisis. Uh, it is the crisis of a continent that once represented an intellectual, cultural, economic and moral leadership. And this continent now sees great powers rising and becoming political and economic giants. This means that for many Europeans, globalization is seen as an opportunity, but it is also viewed as what caused a relative decline. And for a continent like Europe, with the history, which is our history, this means many things, psychologically and politically for the people. And even if they continue to grow, many European countries no fear they will be overtaken by the great world powers. And this great change has been anticipated by political leaders in the aftermath of the Second World War. Uh, men like Robert Schuman, Jean Monnet, Conrad Adenauer, European founding fathers. In France too, Ken. General de Gaulle, who fought to re-establish France's independence and economic powers while strengthening French-German friendship with Adenauer. In order for Europe to resist the world's great changes and in order to keep at bay the threat of war, Europeans sought to build an ambitious project. They put in place a political and economic union constructed not thanks to violence or to conquest, but 
through free adhesion of the states of the under peoples. The idea that union makes strength, which is, as you know, the motto of Europe. And the crumbling down of the USSR, the accelerated pace of globalization, the emergence of BRIC countries, transformed the status quo. The European Union rapidly opened up its doors to Eastern ex-Soviet members and sought to reunify Europe by getting rid of the Iron Curtain, seen by many as a scar tearing the continent apart. The European Union thus, thus grew bigger, following different waves, following the recent <coughs> Croatia adhesion. We are now 28 state members. However, the European project was never redefined. Meanwhile, we built a common currency, the euro, thinking that countries with different economies would progressively converge. 17 countries adopted the currency. Rapid enlargement and common currency, this was the gamble, and they made the bet Europe would be reconciled and prosperous. When it comes to peace, Europe succeeded. And this is a great achievement. Think about the fact that this continent, which saw France and Germany waging war every 30 years, 1870, 1914, 39, uh, uh, 39 is now peaceful. Um, maybe you've read the very famous speech that David Cameron delivered a year ago, more, 18 months ago. This speech was very interesting because the British Prime Minister um, gave um, the idea that Europe had two main goals, peace, achievement, and prosperity. And the conclusion of Cameron is that Europe would, has been successful for peace, but not for prosperity. And this is exactly the challenge that we have to face now. Um, and I would like first to recall the terrible results opinion polls show every time when we survey European and French citizens. Um, the American Institute Pooh Research Center um, has published a very, a very interesting and terrible poll. In 2012, in uh, excuse me, 2012, no, yes, 20, 2012, sorry, 2012, again, <laughs> Six, sorry, it's because of the jet lag. 60% um, of the French respondents were favorable to the European Union, and this number decreased in 2013 to 41. So 60 to 41. Even the Britons rank better with 50, 43. Efforts made during the last half of the 20th century to create a more unified Europe now suffer from the economic crisis. The European project is now discredited discredited in most European countries. All in all, only 45% of the respondents in Europe say they are favorable to the European Union. This means a lot about the doubt of European citizens about the future of the European Union. The rise of populism in Europe is real. And I like to, to say a word about that. For several years, demagogical and extremist leaders have used the crisis to gain votes. Be it the far right, like the French Front National, an incredible 18% in the last presidential election, 18%. Or the leftists, 27% for Syriza in Greece. Even the political parties, 25% for the M5S in Italy. They all play upon fears, upon people's fears. And they scapegoat Brussels and the Euro. Why such a success, a success for extreme right or extreme left, far right, far left? Truth, 
is Europe remained passive for too long. For some states, including France, the euro was seen as an achievement when it should have looked at it as a starting point. The common currency was not the final achievement, it was the beginning of a long pass, and we have probably made a big mistake by not telling enough to the European people how the Euros much bring us to build a future and not only the end of a story. It was all the more important that the creation of the Euro followed the rules and procedures that used to rule the German monetary system. It included independence of the central bank who only controls the monetary mass to monitor inflation and a strong currency which forced everyone to strive for competitiveness in order to protect its exportations. However, Eurozone members adopted very different economic, fiscal, budgetary and social strategies. Instead of converging, they diverge. Let's take the example of France and Germany. Starting during the late 90s, Germany, with Gerhard Schröder, then Angela Merkel, conducted heavy structural reforms to boost its labor market, reduce the cost of the welfare state, and avoid a loss of competitiveness. In the meantime, France benefited from low interest rates to accumulate cheap debts and did not conduct the necessary reforms. Or if it did, it was not as fast enough. We even had a socialist government at the end of the 90s that invented the uniform and mandatory reduction of working hours, the terrible 35 hours a week, and we more and less kept it. The French economy resisted thanks to the competitiveness of its workers, their innovating innovation and the quality of our infrastructures. But in the long run, we French still lost shares of the international market and we were touched by a rise of unemployment in the industrial sector. But other countries, such as Spain or Greece or Italy, experienced a lag between their real economies made of underdeveloped industries and housing and touristic bubbles and the European monetary reality. Coming from the USA, the 2008 crisis had a catalyst effect on Europe. And it revealed and amplified the gap that was widening between the competitive countries and those less competitive. Two radical options were then possible. The first one was to accept the divergences and act alone, but the risk would have been to question the whole European equilibrium and to threaten this great project. The second option was to try and heal the wounds by forcing every country to reform and use more budgetary constraints in order to make economy, economies converge. And I think that the rise of populism in Europe is linked to the economic crisis and the way we, cho we have chosen the second option. It is nurtured by the efforts as to the European peoples to regain competitiveness and reduce deficit. But I also think that there are a consequence of this taboo. The, re the result from the leaders' incapacity to have a vision, to define objectives, and to share those visions and objectives with their disappointed citizens. Being unable to take decisions <clears throat> or not fully admitting the policies we take are what nurtures fears, and as a result, we have those who play upon those fears, the populists. Worse, we say to the people that Brussels, the bureaucracy of Brussels, was responsible for this situation. This is exactly what's happening now in France. As a result, a majority of Europeans believe the crisis is endless and unavoidable. And beyond the economic aspects and the fear of decline, the, risk, the rise of populism is also linked to an uncertain Euro European identity. 
And I would like to stress this second point, which is very important to understand what's up in Europe now. Europe, Europe was marked by Nazi horrors and fascism. It was for a long time reluctant to use the concept of nation and identity because of this past. They did not want to use anything that differentiated between European nationals and foreigners. Some European elites are also touched by the colonial culpability coming from the colonial past of the 19th and 20th century. Because there are many to feel guilty about this difficult past, they largely think that the concept of nation is superfluous and the existence of borders harmful. The ideal became an open Europe without border, identity, roots or model. And in fact, they played it for a tasteless, limitless, cultureless Europe. In the meantime, emerging powers were taking on their model and their values with pride. And this makes a difference. This created a feeling of doubt and a certainty amongst European peoples. Immigration, which intensified and was never controlled nor really accepted, did not help. There are many cultural conflicts and misunderstandings between immigrants and the welcoming people in Europe. Historically, immigration waves within Europe caused problems, namely because they induced more concurrence in the labor market, affecting incomes. Immigration coming from Muslim countries also brought a cultural difference of opinion. And to understand what's going on in Europe, and especially in countries like France, you have to keep that in mind. Let me tell you an anecdote. I am, as can remind, Mayor of Meaux, which is a city close to Paris, 30 miles on the east of Paris. And its very typical population uh, was to face the problem of immigration uh, and the difficulty of what we call in France assimilation. And I remember a story that happened in my city 10 years ago. Um, I met in the street uh, a young lady, 35 years old, coming from Algeria. But she was French. But her family was coming from Algeria. And she was walking with her son who was, who was 10 or 12 years old. And, he was, and she, she come and, and, and say, hello, Mr. Mayor, how are you? Say, Fine. And then she turned to her son and said, hello, you see, this is the mayor of the city. You should ask him something. This is typically, typically French. <laughs> Always asking something when you meet the mayor of the city. And I wanted to be like a teacher, you know? And I said to the, to the, the young boy, I said, you know, and I used the, the famous American sentence of GFK, I said, you shouldn't ask what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And I was proud of me. I said, it's a good opportunity to make pedagogy to this, to this boy. And the boy turned to his, mo his mother and he said, Mom, when are we going to come back to our country? And this was a terrible summary about the failure of uh, the assimilation model in France and, and in Europe, because it means what his mother or his, or his father could have told him to let him think that France was not his country, as he had never been in another one than in France, you see. And this means all the time we've spent by didn't accept the reality of the, the problems of immigration in Europe. For 40 years, um, European countries have failed to correctly name those problems and could not come and could not come up with integrative policies. Um, they should have found ways to adapt the new to new immigrated populations who sometimes possess values that conflicted with liberal European man mindset, gender equality, freedom of opinion, sexual freedom, and uh, you know. All these nourished 
um, feelings like uh, Islamophobia, xenophobia, and these brought very hard tensions in the populations. Uh, the rise complicates everything for parties such as the one that I preside, which are government parties. Um, I am the leader of the French opposition, center-right party, UMP. And one of the main challenges that I have to face as the leader of my party is to bring the people to uh, refuse to support far-right parties, to make sure to everybody that we never will never work with the far right, but at the same time not to vote for them, because if they vote for them, this means new votes for the left wing and not for us. And so this is a very, very huge challenge because we want Europe and France to be fully part of the globalization process and benefit from him from it, but at the same time we cannot lie about the reality of the problems. Immigration, delinquents, unemployment, tax system, failure of the welfare state, all these issues are the key issues for the next decade and we have to face them. To face them. But still, I want to reassure you, Europe of 2013 has nothing to do with Europe of the 1930s. And sometimes I meet American friends who are wondering about what's going on in Europe with the rise of extremists. Uh, it's very different. First of all, because the reaffirmation of nation states, the will to take over Europe politically and to refuse the Brussels bureaucracy are not the starting points of a new totalitarianism. We are not facing with a unified and powerful ideology looming over Europe like a, a spectrum. One needs to remain careful against racism, against anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, which can rise here and there. But I refuse to say that France is racist or Europe is racist. I think there exist political and economic responses to the European crisis and I want to tell you my views about it. First, we need to regain competitiveness. Germany started on, in its own way. We know what we need to do. We have to reduce public spendings, taxes, give our labor market more flexibility, to uh, implement structural reforms on the pension system, the welfare state. We have to do the job, and this is particularly difficult because our people are not totally prepared to face the crisis and the budget reduction at the same time. But we will have to do it. And the present experience of our government shows that we have no other choice than to implement structural reforms. In France, yearly growth corresponded to 6% in the 50s, 3% in the 70s, 1% now. Globally, even in 2013, growth is situated, situated in between 2 or 3 percent, depending on the different measurements. This global transformation called for profound national reforms with one objective, reinforce our competitiveness. Um, there is an indicator. No one looks at, even though it's as important as budgetary deficits, is the commercial deficits minus 67 billion euros for France in 2012, when for Germany it's surpluses of 188 billion euros. <coughs> what does it mean? It means that our economic model is totally unbalanced. We produce less and less, so we have to import a growing part of what we consume. And as a consequence, we run a growing deficit and factories are closing. We consume, but others are producing. The French crisis is not a crisis of demand, it is a crisis of supply, like in other countries in Europe. Our capacity to consume is not the problem because of the welfare state. What is the problem is our capacity 
to produce and sell more goods and services in France. So we'll be able to get rid of the spiral we are stuck it in only if we manage to change our growth model. For a long time, France artificially nourished demand by the development of public employment and redistribution. All this was financed by ever-growing taxes and deficits. Now, this model cannot function anymore. We have to change it radically. And that is exactly the program we are working on at the UMP party. We will have to change that, and I, I want to, to uh, use this very difficult period to make pedagogy with the French people, because the high level of taxes get now, is now the main problem for the public opinion, because people cannot afford them anymore. Our future will depend on our ability to integrate added value here in our national territory, and uh, this is the main challenge for us. France, uh, momentum has arrived. Either we rebuild our model to, take it, to make it competitive, or we will not mark this way. And my uh, intuition is that the French people is now getting awareness about the situation and the fact that we will have to make this crucial choice within the next two or three years. When France and Germany manage to converge towards competitiveness, new initiatives will be launched for a more assertive Europe because all that needs a very strong couple, France and Germany. Um, another priority that will get us out of the European crisis is to accept the permanent assessment of what works and what does not function in the European project, which is very common in America and much harder in Europe. This is time to reaffirm the political dimension of this project, which cannot only be a free trade zone or a space left to the bureaucrats' imagination. For a long time, we viewed Europe as a mechanism for progressive integration without considering the political action components to it. In fact, there are things that work and things that does not work. There are domains in which integration need to be pushed further and others where the most efficient level of action instead of the European one is that of the states, what we call subsidiarity. This is what I call the operation, the operation truth for Europe. Um, I am convinced European, I am a convinced European, but I think that Europe sometimes needs to reassess itself. Um, I could sum up in one sentence, I am so fond of Europe that I want another Europe. For instance, concerning budgetary and tax questions, we should push integration even farther, at least between France and Germany. When it comes to energy, how can we understand that we are not able in Europe to uh, have um, a centralized way for Europeans to buy and negotiate gas and oil? Each country do it by itself. It's impossible today to say we are able to do it for the whole Europe. When it comes to migratory policies, we should strengthen the role of the states in order to take into consideration the different national constraints. Clearly, we need a pragmatic Europe. We need solutions and projects. Europe also needs to take on its borders. Limitless enlargement is a source of exhaustion and inefficiency. Saying this does not correspond to arguing for inward lookingness. It is more about establishing strategic partnership with our neighbors. Uh, with this political will and the reaffirmation of our project, of our roots and our frontiers, I believe Europe will be able to respond to the risk of Euroscepticism. This support from the people is all the more necessary that we have a responsibility to take on the international scheme. As you can see, I remain confident that Europe is capable to bounce back. I believe in France's capacity to regain a European leadership, but in any case, this has to go hand in hand with a profound political renewal 
which contains a vision, a project, and a capacity for leadership. Leading the first French opposition party, which is a government party, be ready for any eventuality in order to prepare for modernization and recovery. This means that we need to start accepting the truth and produce real solutions. It also means that we need to bring about in the coming months the indispensable great reforms for France future. Labor, pension system, immigration, bureaucracy, France doesn't need a hundred propositions, but five or six great structural decisions. And not in five years, in six months. I reflected a lot upon those issues, and I am eager to confront my vision with that of the other international actors. Um, the Asian pivot of the US decided by the Obama administration goes with a certain American withdrawal from Europe, Africa, and from the Middle East. This is what we think coming from Europe. The leadership from behind, which is the new motto, is preferred to direct action. Okay, I got it. But this is no more than ever the time for Europeans to take on more directly their responsibilities and their security. However, we know only France and the UK are putting some efforts into strengthening their defense, even if in both cases military budgets are decreasing. France needs to continue investing in national defense. It must take on its global power role and its importance as a member of the UN Security Council. This is my conviction and I am fighting for it. But France cannot put all the efforts alone. Um, I supported President Hollande's decision to intervene in Mali. In this country, jihadists were about to lead an offensive and attack Bamako, thus taking over control of the status institutions that remained. With the Afghan experience in mind, could we reiterate this sad experience and let Al-Qaeda find a new sanctuary in Mali? Of course not. But France was the only one to intervene. The only one. Europeans seemed shy, reluctant, even when their own security was at stake. And this brings us to think about what must be our part, I mean, the European members, in such <coughs> situations. And that's why there was no hesitation in France about the fact that we have to send troops in Mali. Other Europeans also have to play the game of power. France just rejoined the NATO integrated command structure. It's no longer about competition between NATO and the Europe of defense. Today's danger is not fullness. It is more the emptiness which is threatening our neighborhood, what you call the greater Middle East. It includes for us Maghreb, the Near East, and the Middle East. These regions know a, prof a profound, a deep phase of mutations that come hand in hand with inevitable disturbances and major geopolitical change. Vis-a-vis -vis this area of the world, we've had difficulties defining a doctrine switching from one excess to the other, or at least from one obstacle to the other. Every international system looks for order and strives for stability. Some would consider this realism or cynicism. This is what we Europeans have for a long time prioritized in our approach of the Arab world. We have widely underestimated the frustration of Arab populations. This area before the Arab Springs uh, presented some characteristics. First of all, before the Arab Springs, governments which failed to create wealth and redistribute it. In the meantime, corruption and nepotism. Second, this lack of economic perspectives was coupled with daily 
Berlin imposed by security forces and the repression of public liberties and opposition. Third, a feeling of downgrading on the international scheme, especially with the lack of solutions for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Fourth, archaic methods of governance. Words like soft power, public diplomacy, national dialogue, political forums, were the words missing from the political discourse in these countries. The oldness of leaders has been a key criterion in the fall of government that were said to be immortal. 42 years for Gaddafi, 30 years for Mubarak, 23 years for Ben Ali. We shut our eyes and favored stability and predictability. However, thinking that Arab populations were resilient and accepted to forego the possibilities globalization offer, offers was mistaken. This statu quo was not tenable. The other mistake consists in looking to impose to other people's or democratic values that we consider universal. The international system has to be inspired by this idealism. Our Western democracies uh, have tried to export these values. Free elections, separation of powers, independence of justice, equality between men and women, respect of minorities, sometimes. They did so without taking in consideration the imperative of stabilities, the natives' cultures, and the cultural, political, and religious specificities. This was one of the motives behind Bush administration's intervention in Iraq. And behind all that, we have called the regime change doctrine. I observe now that the Iraqi war and the weakening of the country have directly benefited to Iran, giving this war a strategic importance that the Bush administration was not expecting. Today, feeling guilty or having supported some authoritarian regimes in the Arab world, we have shifted to the extreme opposite, remaining silent except for calling for free elections and for the promotion of democracy. We even rejoice for elections results whatever they are, including when they give the power to Islamists and Muslims brothers. We considered too quickly that Mohamed Morsi in Egypt and Nada in Tunisia were normal interlocutors, but they proved out not to be so. Can we negotiate with Mohamed Morsi and consider him like a real partner while listing Hamas amongst the terrorist organizations? Hamas is just the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. We must stop supporting secular dictators just because we want to protect stability, but we also need to stop treating Islamist political parties like ordinary parties, forces just because they have or had the capacity to win elections. The rejection of political Islam seen in Egypt and in Tunisia, though in a different way, highlights highlights the fact that Islamism was unable to conceive the social and economic changes expected from those revolutions. Its inability to wield power, to get rid of authoritarian practices and the total lack of aptitude for compromise make it incapable for the exercise of the power and surely relegates it to its contestation function of a political system in which it is not really involved. It only took one year in power, one year, to discredit those movements. My friends, I'd like to tell you my conviction. We must combine the search for stability with the concomitant assertion of specific values that reunite us in the lead of international relations. We must respect a specific balance between those two requirements. I would like to illustrate this conviction with some reflections about the topic we discussed today, the Islamic Republic of Iran. After five days of tough international negotiations in Geneva, an agreement on the Iranian nuclear issues was finally reached between Tehran and the negotiating parties in the night between the days of Saturday 23 
and Sunday 24th of November. This agreement is only pre pre preliminary and its aim is to permit the progressive restoration of trust between Tehran and the major powers after decades of tensions. On the one hand, looking for stability can lead us to seek a compromise and make a bet, a bet, on the will of President Rouhani to ensure the, the sustainability of the regime by the construction of a state in constructive interaction, his campaign mantra, with the rest of the world. Some signs can give credit to this position. For example, in the past, Mr. Rouhani often advocated for an improvement in the relations with Saudi Arabia. Following this logic, the Iranian regime would realize that only real concessions on the nuclear issue would make up an international standardization. Rouhani would try to ensure that Iran is on the set threshold and would negotiate the best path. This obsession for uranium enrichment would not aim at acquiring nuclear weapons, even less to use it alone, but would be an instrument in the service of the, the legitimate desire of Tehran to be a great regional power. It shows its will to become an essential and an avoidable spokesperson for all the issues related to the Greater and the Middle East. Why would the Iranian regime cause its political suicide by crossing the line of the unacceptable? Today, Iran thinks of itself as a Bezit, while the country has huge potential. Don't forget the remarkable level of education and formation of younger generation. And Iran has some assets of power. It is true that the Geneva Agreement, if it is followed, contains different items aiming at the reconfiguration of this power in the region and looks to modify regional balances. Four poles would prevail, Iran and Iraq. Turkey, the Gulf monarchies, and Israel. This also presupposes that Iran ceased to exploit Shia minorities in the Gulf and stop considering the Hezbollah as its military wing. I believe that we must not refuse to dialogue with the Iranian people towards whom we have no hostility. These people who choose the most moderate of the less extremist candidate during the presidential election, hope for an, a normalization of relations between Iran and the world. Did we, read, did we need to reach an agreement at any cost? Yes, from the Iranian point of view, according to what I said previously. No, from our point of view. I would rather prefer the lack of an agreement to a bad agreement. Is Geneva a good one? Only the future will tell us. But let's be frank. Like many people in the Western world, I feel very skeptical. And call everybody to be very cautious. And this is exactly what I said the day after the announcement of this agreement. Even if I consider that the compromise found is widely better than the one that was proposed to us 15 days earlier, and I pride myself with the strong position then adopted by the French diplomacy. What are the reasons for my reluctance and my skepticism? On this topic, there is only one certainty. The international sanctions have been effective and brought, of course, the Iran to this negotiation. Um, this temporary agreement relies a lot on trust between the protagonist, trust, confidence. But as soon as the agreement was signed, the Iranian portion publicly asserted that they had no recognized right to enrichment, which was immediately de denied by the US uh, USA Secretary of State. 
In Iran, the moderate have now to convince the extremists. And this is now the challenge for them. It's obvious this regime, which is inspired by different values of ours, doesn't inspire us. We fear that he may find a new vigor following the lifting of sanctions. And it is, is it in our interest to give some air to this regime? Do we have to be excessively kind towards Iranian president? Is the Iranian regime really evolving? Can we trust a regime which call officially for the destruction of Israel? These questions are legitimate and the future of the Middle East depends on their answers. I consider it premature to only rely on the change in tone of President Rouhani to influence our policy, especially as President Rouhani is not the only and genuine decision maker on the nuclear issues. <coughs> Indeed, the decisive role belongs to the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, and everyone knows the important role of the revolutionary guards in Iran's regime, and these guards are hostile to any progress. So we should keep in mind that Assad's Rani's candidacy was endorsed by Ayatollah Khomeini, and he is probably not the great reformer that people want him to be, but instead a clever man in comparison to his infamous predecessor. So, we don't want a nuclear Iran, and at the same time, everyone knows what the dramatic consequences of military strikes would be, especially now that the international community lacks consensus. It also lacks an authorization from the Security Council and a strong coalition of states. The time for coalitions is over. Today, we see there is no leader for the international scheme. The Syrian case showed it, and as a French leader, I can testify that we have noticed that on the Syrian issue, there is no international leadership. We put red lines, and once they were reached, our reaction was too soft. No doubt the Iranian regime learned the lessons the international community stops after the chemical massacre near Damascus of last August 21st. Dictatorial regimes don't take into account the inspiration of their people. Our Western democracies must take into account what we call the war fatigue. We pay a high price for being not enough consistent during the Syrian crisis. The regime is today facing two options which will determine its future. Live up to its general agreements commitments and thus trigger a new dynamic and convince its neighbors that it holds no hostile intention. It's no up to the Iranian regime to prove not only through diplomatic speech Features, but that Iran is committed in a new way and it will respect international obligations. Or, if it proves that the regime once again tried to befool us, we will have to take up our responsibilities. This means we have to be very vigilant and very cautious within this period. These are the main reflections I, wanted to, I would like to, to share with you and I would be very happy now uh, to answer to your questions. Thank you very much. Seen, and especially for the comments about the rise of populism in extremist parties. Now, going to your portfolio as the leader of the UMP, you recently changed your rules for nominating a candidate. Very much like the socialists when they nominated Ségolène Royal in 07, and Francois Hollande in 12, you have a primary, American style, which I believe is open, allowing unaffiliated voters. Is this a reaction uh, to the extreme parties to try to get more popular support and a stronger candidate against Le Pen? 
And does it benefit a political outsider such as Christine Lagarde, should she run for president? Well, um, first of all, you are perfectly right by saying that this is a reaction to the increase of the far right. Because as you know, in the French system, you have two rounds. The first one and then the second one. And which is very important is to make sure that the candidate coming from my party will be alone and one of the two winners of the evening of the first round in order to compete at the second and final round. And so this means we have to make sure that there will be a unique candidate coming from my party. And that's why we decided to uh, organize these primaries in order to select our candidate six months before uh, the general uh, elections. And like that, we make sure that there will not be another candidate than the one of my party selected for the for the second one. And it's directly inspired from the American system. Okay, you noted in your remarks that the, uh, some of the structural weaknesses of the French economy and also a, a weakening of uh, transatlantic ties. Uh, one of the uh, items on the agenda is the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, uh, to which the uh, Frau Merkel, amongst others, is attached a lot of importance. What have you comment, uh, both from the economic point of view geopolitical point of view, or not be this is a uh, useful exercise, and uh, I'd like to see it completely in Well, first of all, um, I am very confident on the capacity of this treaty to help both Europe and America as well to face uh, the challenges of globalization for the next decades. Because what's going on in Asia brings us to think that we really need to strengthen our economic structures. So this means that for Europe, this treaty can be a great opportunity, like in America as well. We have to be cautious on the rules of this treaty, because I think that it's very important to get to reciprocity. I mean, I know that in America you are protecting some of your markets, so we have to, to be clear on a real balanced agreement. But I think this is a real opportunity for us. Second, this treaty uh, will bring us, we French, to implement structural reforms. Because if we, want to be, if, if we want to be competitive, we have to implement these reforms. Labor market, cost of labor, pension system, public spendings, welfare state. This is a big agenda for France. But I think we have no other choice. And my opinion is that the French people is now getting aware about the necessity to make it because, because of what's going on in Europe. And uh, my, my people, is a, my country is composed with a very proud people. I mean, we, we, we surf, we're suffering now about the so-called decline of Europe and of France. And I think this will bring us to think about the way to to overcome uh, this situation by implementing structural reforms. So this treaty can be an opportunity. The second remark I would like to make on your question is that according to me, what's going on in the world needs Europe to build a new tie, a new alliance, uh, to give a new impetus to its relations with America. Uh, I told um, just before the fact that um, we all understand that America is now focused on Asia and is thinking about the way to withdraw uh, its presence in the Middle East and, and in Africa. So this means we will have to play our own part. We will have probably to think about a new link with America and a new kind of relations with Africa, and this can be probably 
a new orientation for our diplomacy and of course our, for our economic policy. And this brings us many opportunities for the future. So I am confident in our capacity to use this treaty to bring a new impetus for our continent and especially for France. But we will be cautious on the way it's written. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, could you comment on energy security of Europe uh, in the future and possibility of exploration of shale and such sources? Just to contribute to energy security. Well, first of all, we're we're watching very cautiously how it's how it's done here in your country. Um, it's a big taboo with the, the Greens, as you know. And the Greens belong to the majority, and, and President Hollande said he will never open the question. But Mr. Hollande once will not be president anymore. So we, will, we are thinking about the future after him. And, and I noticed that shale gas is an opportunity for growth, for jobs, um, and for economic developments, research, development, and so on. So um, I think once this issue will not be any more taboo in Europe and in France, as you know, the French soil has many uh, opportunities on shale gas, so we are working on that. And things will probably change. But we first have to make sure that environment is protected, especially in areas where there is a high part of population. It is not the same when you have a high part of population or when it's in desert. Thank you, Gerald Chandler. Uh, could you comment some more about the 35-hour week? In particular, uh, President Sarkozy said, uh, work more and earn more. How many French people say work less and earn less? And how many people think they can work less and earn more? Very good question. Very good American question <laughs> about French situation. Um, I do agree with you. Um, I'm a father. I'm a mayor. I'm a political leader, but I'm also a father. And as I want to help my children, I wouldn't tell them to work less in order to be su successful in their life. Unfortunately, in France, there is a socialist uh, government at the end of the 90s who decided to implement this 35-hour legislation which is for us a terrible burden because when President Chirac and President Sarkozy were elected, they didn't want to, 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 to give up with this legislation. They just decided to pay more extra hours. Um, my opinion is that this solution was all right before the, Europe, before the economic crisis of 2008 is not possible anymore. We really have to uh, give up with this legislation and to bring our country to work more in order to earn more. So there is no doubt about that. Uh, unfortunately, it's impossible for a left-wing government to change it because they created it. And, and you know, in France, I don't know how it is in America, but in France, it's always very difficult to say, sorry, I was wrong. I don't know if you do that in America, but in France, it's impossible. So, the only way for us is to, to bring that to the public debate and to say to the French people, let's be sincere. How can we make it with such a burden? So um, we are going to vote in the UMP party next January a new platform, and I will put down the vote of the uh, volunteers, and they will decide to give up with this legislation, and we will propose it for the next elections. To the French people. And this will be a very crucial choice because this means we can increase competitiveness, we, we, we can decrease uh, the cost of labor, 
And this will probably give a new impetus, and it's probably the key issue today, to have a new relation with uh, work, with labor in France, but more than in France, in, in, in Europe, because the European model since 1945 was uh, uh, organized around the idea of uh, working less, having a, a, a more efficient welfare state, and I mean it doesn't work anymore. So we have to change that. And the, the, the German model showed it was possible, so we have to do it now. And this is the challenge. And the next question is, how can you be elected by such a program? <laughs> and the, the answer is, do it for your children and for the future of your country. And I will do it. Good evening, Mr. Coté, as you can hear in French too. Uh, my question to you is more of a, a problem that I face at every French election. I agree with what you say and I like what you say on economics, on the need for reform, on the need to, to find new competitiveness in France. Uh, so I would be happy to vote for your party for these reasons. At the same time, when you speak of immigration, I cannot help but disagree because I do not happen to believe that immigration is one of the main challenges facing France today. And I think too often it's used to actually turn attention away from the real problem, which is really unemployment in France. So um, my question is just, what should we do, people like us? You know, don't you feel like by being too tough on immigration, which sounds a bit strange in America, by the way, uh, you're just losing some votes from people who are reformist, but who just don't want to blame immigration. Thank you. No, um, there is no real difference between what you say and what I think uh, about immigration. The problem is that um, the uh, immigration policy in France is not clear anymore. Uh, we don't really know who we welcome and what for. We don't really know how to reach the main goal, like in America, like everywhere in the world, how being sure that the man or the woman who choose to immigrate in our country will be successful for himself and for his children tomorrow. This is the main challenge. Or today, and today, um, we've been failing on this question in France and in, uh, even in other countries in, in Europe. And this explains this phenomenon of xenophobia, Islamophobia, and so on. We cannot deny this reality. This is a reality. And according to me, uh, we have to, to create a new policy for immigration. Because today, France is the most attractive country in Europe for social reasons. I mean, for social benefits. That's why uh, a family coming from Croatia, Kosovo, or whatever, chooses France. Because socially, for illegal people, it is the, more, the most attractive. According to me, we cannot continue like that. Uh, we have to, to, to select, to have an immigration which is um, uh, corresponding to the economy, to the economic needs, like in America. And today, all this is confused and, and we, we are not successful. So we have to put that in the agenda in order to, to build a new, uh, a new immigration policy. When you say the main problem is unemployment, you are right, of course. But I th I'm, according to me, all these have to be uh, put together and, and, and with a vision, with a strategy. And we don't have any vision today on this question. So that's why I'd like to propose what we call a chosen immigration, and which this will make a difference, which is very close to the American model, very close. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, you mentioned in your remarks that uh, you would like to see uh, a border uh, alliance set up uh, at, uh, for the enlargement of Europe that it cannot go indefinitely. Uh, I come from Macedonia, one of the candidate countries. Can you tell me? Where do you see this uh, line being drawn with regard to uh, the former Soviet republics, to Turkey, to the Balkans? Uh, and also, I was just reading a report, uh, once these countries are in, I mean, the former communist countries which have already joined, uh, there is now a report that the current French government is calling for uh, uh, introducing a minimum wage, a European-wide minimum wage, assuming this would protect French jobs, keep them in uh, France, uh, 
at a time when poorer South European countries and former communist countries have much more relaxed labor laws. So how do you view this? Uh, uh, I certainly leave French uh, opinion because, as you know, Angela Merkel in, is, in her new coalition has decided to, in, to implement a new minimum wage in, in Germany too, and there are other countries. Well, my opinion uh, about enlargement is that I think that we, we have just to, to put on pause for a while in order to, uh, to make sure that we have a political project. Today, many European citizens get skeptical about Europe because of this enlargement that hasn't been explained to anybody and brings competitiveness, but not in the best, sen best sense. So we really have to think about what could be a political construction of Europe. So that's why, according to me, the question, the question now is not to enlarge and enlarge, just have stopped in order to think about a political project. But at the same time, I think we, can, we could be able to develop partnerships with many other countries, which means to be very close to them, even to give them facilities on many issues. But at the same time, let's think about what could be the most efficient political organization for Europe. Because up to now, the problem is to see what do we have in common. And the, the present situation means that we have the peace in common, but not any more prosperity. And this is the main challenge that we have to face, you see. And this maybe brings me to another point, which is very important. I think, and this is specifically true for the French people, but not only, we really need to see what's going on abroad. Um, we are focused on our internal problems, domestic problems and not enough um, observing what's going on in other countries. And that's too bad. First of all, because it would be an opportunity for us to understand how happy we are in our own countries, in our own continents. And second, it's because we, we could need, learn more about rest, best practices. But for that, it would be better to speak more English. <laughs> and the problem is that, for instance, in my country, I don't know in your country, but in my country, French people do not speak enough English, you see, and it's, I'm defending French speaking, no problem, but I think it would be better if the French people were able to speak more for English, because it's a way to understand more, to learn more about what's going on abroad, you see, because unfortunately many things are in English speaking, and, uh, and you know, us French people are proud, they don't want to show that they're not understood. And so they don't speak to the other, you see? And that's too bad, because I think communication is, is the key priority now, just to understand that globalization means many positive things when we can share them. And this is the main challenge. And this probably will be the opportunity for the next decade to do that as well. Thank you. Mr. President, I think you were very clearly understood this evening, and I think that uh, all of us in Washington look uh, with some jealousy upon you. It's nice to hear a leader calling clearly for reform in Paris, reform in Brussels, and being very skeptical of reform in Tehran. And so, for those reasons and others, we're very grateful for your remarks this evening, and which characteristically led up to, which characteristically followed uh, your frankness. Uh, and your deep insight, and we want to thank you for uh, honoring us thank by speaking at the city. Thank you. Thank you.